I'm about to embark on something I've never done before. Um, in the shop, which is well used, I've built a lot of stuff. Um, mostly out of wood, but a lot of different things too. And uh, this time though, it's going to be something different, something smaller. I've been doing a lot of fishing lately, and I think I'd like to try my hand at making some crankbaits. They seem to work good on this lake. This lake is about six miles long, four and a half miles on the main part. We saw it earlier, part of it. It's only about a quarter to a half mile wide. Um, it's 90 feet deep in one spot, but there are shallow and deeper areas. And there's very little structure, so crankbaits work pretty well in it. Even in uh, 60 feet of water, I can catch fish in about 5 or 10 feet down. <clears throat> um, this is something completely new. And as I do this, um, what I'm going to do is, is try to record every step of the way, show the tools that I've acquired, the materials that I've acquired, and how I've gone about it. I don't know how it's going to work out. Hopefully my first one will at least be half decent. It'll be exciting to fish with a lure that I've made. So I'm kind of looking forward to that possibility. Um, I've never done anything like this and uh, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube that shows you how to do it. There's a lot of videos, a lot of guys making them out there that are really pretty good at it. Um, the one that I tend to watch a lot is a, a young young man with a new baby at this, at this recording and uh, he has a YouTube channel called Marling Bates M-A-R-L-I-N-G Marling Bates you can you can search for it on YouTube and look at some of the stuff from the last couple of years because uh, he does a really good job he's quite talented and he's uh, very clear on sharing how he does it I'm using a lot of his techniques uh, because he's what I've been watching the most and um, he has the clearest explanations and he has some of the techniques see some of these things can be done in different ways his seem very doable with existing things that we have I've had to pick up quite a bit of stuff as a matter of fact um, I could have probably purchased an awful lot of baits off the shelf um, for what I've spent in, in trying to, uh, to get this going. And I have a few more things left to pick up that I will do along the way. But the idea of, of fishing with something that you've made, um, that's good. And it's turning cold now. This is Maine, and um, it is October 22nd. Um, the fishing is kind of done here. So the winters are long, and um, I'd like to produce one crankbait to see how it goes and if it does go well then possibly produce several more and then work with them in the spring um, fishing with them, bass, crappie and a few other species we have here and see how it goes well it'll be time to get started um, this is the piece of wood I'm going to use of the things that I've built, they've been mostly hardwood, maple, oak, walnut. Um, and up in the attic, I found a piece of pine, which is unusual that I only have this one piece of pine because you can't turn around in Maine without walking into a white pine tree. So, I'll be using this one piece. It doesn't look like I'll have to go buy any. 
and um, we'll go from there. So, on with the production of my first crankbait. It is another day, and before I start actually building this crankbait, um, I want to show you all of the uh, some of the materials that uh, I procured in order to um, get this thing done. It isn't cheap, and I've got just about everything I need, so let's get started. Um, I've also made a web page so that, and I'll put a link to it down below, which lists all of this stuff. And I don't have links to where you can buy it. A lot of it came from Amazon because over time those links just die um, on, on uh, store sites. So I'll just give a description of what they are and sometimes the brands. Okay, first of all, and most importantly I think, is the airbrush. Here's the airbrush that I picked up. And um, this is the box. It's an Iwata airbrush. There are lots of different airbrushes. Some are very inexpensive and some are very expensive. Um, it's the single largest item purchase that I made. Um, and looking at, at all of the airbrush sites and then people who do crankbaits also, um, one thing that they, that they mention is that if you go cheap on the airbrush, you'll, you'll kind of regret it and end up getting a good one eventually because they end up splattering and so forth. I don't know if that's true. I'm kind of taking their words for it. I don't think they're lying to me. Um, <coughs> so the one they seem to recommend a lot, even though there are a few other good ones, is the Iwata. This one um, I got from Hobby Lobby, um, but they're available on Amazon and a whole bunch of other places. Um, this one I, I got it because it was on sale for $149, but you'll see them like $169 um, other places. This is the, um, let's see, the HPCS. Um, that's the one they recommend as far as the, uh, the spray pattern and the fact that it's gravity feed from the top. Um, and I guess it's a, it's a pretty, good, pretty good airbrush. Haven't used it yet. Um, so <laughs> I'm a newbie as far as airbrushing is concerned, so it should be really interesting with the first crankbait. I'll probably cut a couple of pieces of wood, or I know they use small pieces of PVC pipe and try it out just to get used to it and try some on paper and so forth to try to get a little, a little used to it. Um, when, I, when I do that, uh, hopefully when I come to do the, the actual crankbait, it will go a little more smoothly. Um, the airbrush needs a compressor. And the compressor, you need 20, from what I understand, 20 to 40 pounds of air pressure. Now, you can buy a dedicated airbrush compressor. Um, but if you happen to have a, an air compressor for, like, shop work, for a nail gun, or for other, other things, um, it will work. And you don't need a big one. Uh, it can be a small one. I have both. I have a large one, which is actually right below me in the garage that's um, uh, 80 gallon, which is overkill for this. And I do have a smaller one, which is a three gallon one, which I take uh, when I need a, a nail gun someplace. Um, so I'll pro I, I could use either one. I'll probably be using the smaller one. You also need an air hose, um, and they have ones that are specifically for airbrushes because they have a fitting on the end that is European um, instead of the NPT connectors you normally see on, see on, on air hoses um, and, uh, for American stuff. You know, it's like, like a metric thing. Um, <coughs> so you'll, you'll want to make sure you get that. Now this one has an eighth inch and a quarter inch fitting. And I've got that because I am going to some... Uh, quarter and stuff having to do with my air compressor. If you have a dedicated airbrush compressor, eighth of an inch to an eighth of an inch is what you probably want. Um, this one is also Iwata. Um, it's a little bit more expensive than a lot of the others. I mean, you can get them for like seven or eight dollars, um, but the reviews on them say that they leak and they have problems with them. The Iwata one has almost 100% um, good reviews. Um, so I would expect that if they're going to sell, sell you a decent airbrush, um, they probably don't want you uh, falling down as far as the, the air hose is concerned. They sell them 6 feet and 10 feet usually. I got the 10 foot one just to have the added 
ability to, to not have to be having a shore hose on me all the time. Now, if you are going to go the route of using your own compressor instead of a dedicated um, airbrush compressor, um, you're going to need to have um, a regulator for it. Um, the, I believe the, the, um, the, the dedicated compressors made for airbrushes already have that on there because you need to, to be able to cut it down between 20 and 40 pounds. Um, uh, large air compressors are usually set at 90 to 100, 120 pounds for, for air tools. Um, so if you're going to do that, then you're going to need this. This is the regulator. I've got mine mounted to the wall and it's mounted to my compressor cable here. Um, I have mine mounted with a quick disconnect. Um, it has a gauge on it so that you can adjust the, um, the air and it goes up really high but 20 to 40 is right around in here. This is the adjustment knob and down here is a collector for moisture and you clean it, when you get a little moisture in, you clean it out by holding this out and it'll blow it out. Um, the, uh, it's important to have a moisture filter um, because if you don't, you get, you get spatter in the paint when it comes out. So it's very good for that. There's all kinds of these. They're not really that expensive. Um, and I'm hoping that it, that it lasts a while. Um, but if you're going to have a large or your own compressor other, other than a dedicated compressor for an airbrush, you need one of these to cut the pressure down because the pressure that your compressor has is probably not going to be low enough um, unless you do this, unless you have an adjustment gauge on your compressor where you can easily adjust it down and up as you want to. Okay, other items. Um, and I, I'll just take these in random order. There's no specific order that I'm doing these. Um, let's see. Okay. I have some small alligator clips that I actually got from the dollar store. They came for like a card of five for a dollar. And this will be for putting the um, screening or netting on to make the scale pattern. If you haven't seen that online, yeah. you'll hopefully see it when I do it. Um, I have some airbrush cleaner, which I, I would imagine is really important because the uh, fine needle in this airbrush um, could get clogged up and could really re wreak havoc. So I'm going to be cleaning my airbrush um, pretty religiously, um, trying to, uh, to keep that clean so it, all, it will always work good. What else do we have here? A little basket. Um, <clears throat> I have some tongue depressors and some cheap brushes and uh, those will be for mixing the epoxy at the end for the final coat and also for brushing it on. Uh, some tweezers for putting on the, um, the eyes, which I may or may not need, but I look, look like they'll be handy. All this stuff comes from the dollar store, so there's not a whole lot of expense here. Um, this is the epoxy. It's two-part epoxy for the final coat. Um, you mix some, and, um, and this is um, equal, equal parts. Mix one to one. So you mix them one to one, and uh, they um, make the final coat and that polished gl under glass look. Um, finish on the um, on the crankbait. Um, I also have on order, but I don't have it yet, a small digital scale um, for mixing the epoxy. You can mix it one to one pretty accurately from what I understand, but you have to be pretty close to make it so that it works well. Um, they rec it's recommended that it's w each item is weighed out. Um, and you don't need that much, so you need a small digital scale that measures in, in ounces and fractions of an ounce, which is coming in. The little scales, by the way, uh, the one I'm buying is, is $8, so that they're, they're not that expensive. They're made for, for weighing food amounts and some other things I'm in the kitchen. Um, I have some 5-minute two-pot epoxy, and that is mostly used for two things. One, for gluing in all of the um, the eye loops that I'll be making in order to, to put the hooks on and put the, uh, the, the line on the front of the, um, of the crankbait and also to put the fish eyes on. You can order cards of these little fish eyes um, fairly inexpensively um, online and they come in various sizes as you can see in various colors. 
I have a little bottle here, it's really a medicine bottle, but I have it filled with baking soda and some super glue. And both of these will be used to fill the hole where the lead ballast will be going in the bottom of the epoxy. Put the super glue on top of the baking soda and it makes, it makes a hard surface which you can file and, um, um, and sand and it becomes part of the, part of the crankbait afterwards. This seems so funny talking about this this way because I haven't done any of this. This is just talking from what I've seen online. I have some 20 gauge wire, stainless steel wire, that I'll be using to make my own eyelets. Um, I'm hoping that it's large enough. It seems to be. And there's a very specific way they make this uh, with a dowel and a drill. And uh, you can make some pretty good eyelets that, um, that hold it very well. And of course they're stainless. They won't, they won't corrode. Um, and those will be glued in. Um, into the to the crankbait. Um, I have a glue stick, a child's glue stick, um, for gluing the pattern on the wood so it can be cut out. It can be handy. You can use almost anything for that. Um, I have uh, these rings for putting the hooks on the crankbait, and I have a box of uh, Mustad hooks. Um, I ordered a size 2 for the crankbait that I'm making. I may actually order a 3 or 4. Um, we'll see. That'll come at the end anyway. I, I, you know, that's the last thing that goes on the crankbaits. And it's not really part of the making of it or finishing it anyway. And uh, these are always come in handy um, for use on some of my other larger baits anyway. So it's not a waste. I have a razor knife um, that will be used for actually some of the carving. Um, of the edges of the, uh, the camfering of, of the bait. This is a rotisserie. After you've made the crankbait and have applied the epoxy, the epoxy can sag with gravity if it's just left hanging in one position. So it's highly recommended that um, the, the crankbait is rotated. And it's done by clipping the bill of the crankbait if it has one, and mine will, I'm making shallow water crankbaits, to the rotisserie with something like this a clip and then letting the whole thing rotate very slowly. Now this is done with a rotisserie motor. Now this isn't, isn't, isn't a rotisserie motor. Um, you could use a rotisserie motor, but I chose not to get one. And the reason was is that there's another type of motor like this that has a shaft that's already built into it. Um, the rotisserie motor has a square hole and you have to buy a shaft to put into it. And I was going to do that. Um, I was thinking of just taking a metal rod and, and grinding down to a square surface and putting it in, but I thought it might be you know, a little loose or wobbly. So for a few dollars more, normally it's $15, $16 for, for a rotisserie motor, but this type um, is about uh, 24 25 dollars and it's called a if you should look it up online a cup tisserie motor and it's really a regular rotisserie motor except that it has the shaft on here and comes with a plastic sleeve that these foam blanks fit on and you put cups over them and you can paint them and then they rotate and I guess they dry the same way um, so for the convenience of that and the fact that it has a screw-on plate instead of some little slots to slide into your to your barbecue grill um, so it could be screwed onto a stand like this that I made, um, I chose to spend a few extra dollars and get this one. Uh, you plug it in, it's got a switch on the side that rotates very slowly and supposedly it keeps the epoxy from drying uh, with gravity so it sags or grips in one direction. Um, again at the dollar store couple of small clips that I have um, and those will be um, clipped on to the bill of the crankbait like I said and in order to do that I have some polycarbonate that you can get at any box store um, uh, this one is not too thick I've seen some really thick ones used too um, it is highly recommended and I'm not highly recommending this because remember I haven't made one of these yet but it is highly recommended that you use polycarbonate. Polycarbonate, and I use polycarbonate so I can understand this. Um, this is a piece I had in the shop. Um, 
it's, it's very, very tough. It's, it's flexible and not brittle. If you use acrylic, it can be brittle. So if you have a crankbank that's hitting the rocks um, as you're reeling it in, um, it, could, it could chip. Uh, this stuff won't chip. It's really tough. It's used in the, in the airline industry and the Air Force for, for, for uh, some clear areas on, on planes and stuff. Um, so it's really, really, really rugged stuff. Um, so that's the other uh, rotisserie for that. And um, we also have uh, paints. Now I have this little tote here because in the winter I don't heat this, this shop all the time. I heat it when I come out. Um, so that I'm going to need to bring these in and out with me because these paints are acrylic and they will freeze. And any type of latex or acrylic paint that freezes um, usually separates and uh, does not work, work well afterwards. Now, it is recommended and from what I see um, when, I, when I look online, uh, there are basically three types of paint that we want. One is a paints that are opaque so they're solid and then and sometimes you'll want to spray over those opaque paints with another color um, but you don't want to completely hide the, the, the opaque paint that you put on which is what this would do if you sprayed like a red over a green it would just hide the green so they do have transparent paints which are those same colors but they're kind of see-through when you um, when you uh, paint with them. Now I got these sets. Um, first of all, I had a coupon at Hobby Lobby again, um, but I got these sets because I figured I would end up using a lot of these colors, and buying them separately is actually quite a bit more expensive than buying the same bottles of paint in a set. And these um, these sets are, uh, I believe, they're two two or four ounces. Um, but from what I see um, with an airbrush where they just put two or three drops in, uh, they should last quite a while. The airbrush did come with some uh, little sets of paints. There were four, four little bottles in here that were in the box, um, but I picked up these. Um, these are Cretex paints. There are many brands. A lot of the people who make crankbaits seem to use these. So I got these. I figured if they're successful for them, they'll hopefully be successful for me. Now there is a third type of paint that I will be picking up, but I haven't yet, and there's a reason I haven't done it, um, and that is the pearl paint, the pearlized paint. A lot of the crankbaits have like a pearl underbelly, you know, or maybe some other areas, and I haven't picked them up yet because I won't, you don't need a whole set of colors. You may need one or two colors on most of the crankbaits you make, um, so I'll pick those up separately. Um, so that um, I don't have colors that I paid for that I will probably never use. Um, so, up to this point, those are the materials I have. I still have a scale, which is coming in in a couple of days. I have a fitting for the airbrush um, to help adapt to the, to, the, um, to the compressor that I have. And I have a quick disconnect that I'll be able to take and disconnect this in order to put it away in a safe place and to uh, and to clean it more easily probably later on. Uh, when I do make the crankbait, um, I have downloaded these patterns. And the pattern that I will be using will be this one. It says, it says it's two inches, but it's actually three. Um, it's not a huge crankbait, but it's also not a small one. And um, I decided to make one that's a little bit larger, and that's about the maximum size I'd want to use for the, for the lake that I have here for the size fish. The bass are usually here around one and a half to two and a half pounds. Um, so this is a, a decent sized crankbait for that. Um, and I'll be using that pattern, I'll be tracing it on a piece of wood. And then I also downloaded a pattern for the, uh, the bills. And I'll pick one of these uh, to go on the, on the crankbaits. Both of these, and many others are available online. I'm not going to post the link to them. Just do a search for crankbait patterns um, on Google and you'll come up with, with all kinds of them. And many of them are printable and you just print them out. Um, then you'll be able to, to cut them out and glue them on um, your wood and then cut your wood from there and have the pattern just as you need it. Um,
Okay, that's basically for the stuff that, I, that I've acquired for now. Um, there are a few other things, some sandpaper and a, and a, and a few other items, but um, we'll, hopefully we'll see them as, 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 uh, as, as this goes along. So, that's it for right now. Uh, the next um, thing you see should be me with some wood in the pattern and hopefully cutting this out uh, in order to start the crankbait.